Hi everyone, this is Ilinka Vartik for PianoCareerAcademy.com and today's video is focused on a painful problem that sadly too many players struggle with these days. Piano injuries. May they be located in your hand, wrist, forearm, elbow, shoulders or your back. We will go behind the curtain, identify the real causes, learn how to avoid each one, what to do instead and how to recover from an existing injury. Before we get started, please don't forget to subscribe to my channel and ring the bell so that you don't miss any new tutorials and many of them are coming in the near future. I'll begin with a simple fact that unfortunately many players are not aware of. Correct piano playing does not cause pain and injuries. Never tolerate pain because pain is the body's only way to tell you that you're doing something wrong. At the first sign of discomfort, stop, take a break and identify the cause of your pain by using the information you are about to learn. Of course, I am not a doctor, so in this video we will only focus on piano-related injuries and we will not look into problems that are caused or aggravated by age or various medical conditions. Always speak to your doctor when in doubt. There are four mega causes of piano injuries. The first troublemaker is bad posture and incorrect arm alignment. Slouching when you play. Tilting your neck forward so that this natural line between your spine and the crown of your head is disrupted. Raising your shoulders. Sitting too low sitting too close to the instrument, gluing your elbows to your side, having sharp angles in your wrist. These and other elements of a bad posture can result in headaches, backaches, shoulder pain and of course arm and hand injuries. Any locking, stiffness or exaggerated bending in your body and your joints will cause discomfort, tension, fatigue, pain, and ultimately a more severe problem. To avoid injury, good posture is very important. The back is straight, one line from the crown of your head to your tailbone, as yoga instructors like to say. Your bench is properly adjusted so that the elbows are aligned with the keys. The feet are grounded, placed near the pedals if you're not using the pedals. Your shoulders are down and relaxed. The arms are loose and there are no sharp angles in your elbow or wrist. Your arms should feel like wings that are breathing freely, so don't glue them to your torso. This should feel good. There should be comfort, ease and freedom of movement. Also, make sure that the shoulders, elbows, wrists and hands are well aligned. There should be one line of energy from your back to your fingertips. And you can learn more by watching my tutorial on this topic. At this point, however, there's something very important to keep in mind. A good piano posture is not something you hold. It is not static, tensed or rigid. It's simply a neutral alignment where your joints and muscles feel comfortable and at ease. It's a starting point that allows full range of motion. It is flexible, fluid and breathing. So, a good posture is a process, not a pose. Metaphorically speaking, it's a movie, not a picture. And it's always adapted to the layout of the piece you're playing. The second mega cause of piano injuries is incorrect technique. About 95% of piano beginners these days play the piano incorrectly by using inefficient and unhealthy movements. Incorrect technique is a plague that keeps spreading. It thrives because of misinformation and also the desire to cut corners and play difficult pieces too soon without taking the time to learn how the body works and how to adapt our physiology to the mechanics of this instrument. 
In this video, we will take a look at five aspects of incorrect technique that cause pain, injuries, and also sabotage your progress. These days, finger-only playing is the number one cause of piano injuries among amateur and self-taught students. It means pressing the keys by using separate finger movements, <laughs> which is very difficult, and keeping the wrist and arm disconnected and usually motionless and tensed in this process. Why is this harmful? The piano keyboard does not work like a computer keyboard. Because of the hammer mechanism, the piano keys are heavy and they offer resistance when depressed. The piano keys also have depth, so there's quite a distance between surface and the keybed. The finger muscles are weak on their own. If you use separate finger movements to depress the heavy piano keys, they will get fatigued very soon. Wrist and arm tension, the usual companions of finger-only action, amplify this fatigue even more. This type of technique is not efficient or ergonomic. Simply put, it is not adapted to the construction of the piano, and it doesn't take into consideration the biomechanics of the human body. Playing piano with your fingers alone can be compared to trying to walk by only wiggling your toes instead of moving your entire leg from the hip, or hitting a tennis ball with a small flick of your wrist instead of taking the energy from this whole body rotation. The smaller the muscle you use for a certain task, the harder that task becomes and the higher the risk of injury. When you only use your fingers, playing the piano feels like a struggle. It's an effort and it doesn't feel good. Your hand muscles and forearm tendons get overworked and soon enough the inevitable fatigue degenerates into pain. If you ignore this pain and keep going, you will most likely injure yourself. And here is where problems such as tendinitis or repetitive strain injury come into play. To avoid injury, play the piano by using the ergonomic techniques called whole arm action and weighted playing. You need to use the entire potential of your body, starting with the powerful muscles from your back and reaching the last finger joint. All of them are important, but the force needed to depress the heavy keys comes from the larger muscles of the back and it is channeled through the loose arm and wrist into the fingertips and the keys. So there is no need to strain and overwork the fingers. In whole arm action, gravity plays a big role and so does the leverage principle. Piano playing is a whole body activity, not a finger or hand activity. If you use your body efficiently, your playing will be comfortable, effortless, and also painless. Many method books nowadays are still based on the old-school five-finger approach. The beginner's hand is placed on this position and they are asked to play legato straight away by only lifting their fingers I can't even do it properly without changing position or involving the arm and wrist in the process. Separate finger action is not the only danger of these methods. Legato and now I played it properly, is a difficult articulation effect because it involves finger articulation. So don't get me wrong, finger movement is very important, 
but if we start using the fingers before we learn how to use the arm, we are guaranteed to do it incorrectly. And you already know the consequences of that. To avoid injury, choose a method book that starts with non-legato playing, such as Nikolaev's Russian School of Piano Playing, which we use in our course for beginners. Non-legato is the safest way to learn whole arm action correctly. Simply put, first we learn how to use the arm as a unit, how to channel weight, how to keep the joints loose and flexible. Only when this is internalized, we incorporate finger action into the formula. We move to staccato and then to legato. And even then, we begin by connecting two notes and we don't simply pay attention to what the fingers are doing. The arm and wrist movements are very important here as well. And we also aim for a beautiful sound and a singing transition between notes. Then we connect three notes. And when we do reach a five finger position, our muscles and brain are ready to do it safely. Playing with stiff wrists, immobile arms in a static manner with constant effort and no relaxation will 100% result in fatigue and pain. To avoid injury, you have to understand the cycle of effort and relaxation. Of course, we cannot be completely relaxed when we play the piano. If we were, we would fall off the bench. Some effort is needed, so our muscles do contract at certain times. But if we use whole arm action correctly, we can keep this effort to a minimum, delegate it to the bigger muscles, and also learn how to relax continuously. In other words, small efforts and ample relaxation are always alternating, forming a never-ending cycle. This way your muscles get refreshed as you play, not when the piece is finished. And fatigue does not have a chance to accumulate. And there are some other important things to keep in mind here. Playing the piano is about constant fluid motion with no pockets of tension. Also, our wrists have to be flexible and anticipate the layout of the music. The wrists are bridges that connect the arm with the hands. That's why wrist relaxation is crucial in ergonomic piano playing. It's also important to keep your hands constantly breathing. And even in playing repetitive structures, as you can see, my hands keep breathing. There's always a little bit of motion. I always take time to relax, even if it's a micro relaxation between these positions. If you want to learn more, I have a detailed tutorial on this topic. Another thing is to find comfort even in the most difficult passages. So whether you have fast runs or a series of octaves or powerful chords, try to find the underlying pillars and the most ergonomic movements that are suitable for every case and practice those structures smartly by using the magnifying glass practice method instead of simply playing them through and hoping for good luck. If you perceive piano playing as a finger activity, you will feel the need to stretch your fingers each time you come across a wider interval. Some people even do finger stretching exercises, which are very dangerous and really not worth it. To avoid injury, use whole arm action and the wrist navigation technique. 
Remember, our fingers are not leaders in piano playing. They are followers. If you have a wider structure, don't initiate the movement with your fingers. Don't strain and overstretch them. Initiate the movement with your arm. The arm and the wrist lead the way. They are the navigator and they take the fingers to the needed position in advance so that stretching is kept to a minimum. A good example is Chopin's Etude in A flat major, opus 25, number one, that many students play like this, trying to cover these distances by stretching their fingers alone, when it is so much more comfortable to reach everything by performing these natural arm and wrist movements. Key bedding is another form of incorrect technique. As you probably know, we cannot control the piano sound after it has been produced. Once the key has reached the key bed, that's it. There is nothing we can do to make the sound louder or change its quality. Still, some players like to keep pressing the key or the keys with a lot of effort instead of holding them lightly by only using the natural weight of their hands. If we hold the key correctly, this is an occasion to relax and refresh our muscles. Remember the cycle of effort and relaxation? Do you see how I'm completely loose and yet the key is still pressed? If you are key bedding, on the other hand, you are not taking advantage of this opportunity, so you are increasing your fatigue and a risk of injury. So to avoid injury, make sure that as soon as the key has reached the key bed, there is muscular release and you are only using the minimum amount of weight that is needed to keep that key down. Before we wrap up the technique compartment of this video, I will answer a common question. Is a bit of hand and arm fatigue normal when we practice? To be on the safe side, I will say no, not really, especially if you are a beginner. Sure, if you're an advanced student and you have been practicing a least etude for three hours in a row, you will most likely feel a bit of pleasant fatigue in your entire arms, but without any centralized painful sensations. This fatigue will go away soon and the next day your arms will feel completely refreshed. But if you're a beginner, and you feel fatigue after each practice session, even though your pieces are easy, it means that you're doing something wrong. And instead of tolerating this fatigue, you should take a few steps back, reassess the situation, and make sure your posture, technique, and practice habits are healthy. Speaking of practice habits, the third mega cause of piano injuries is incorrect practice. In this video, we will analyze seven main aspects of incorrect practice. Mechanical playing, skipping your warm-up, irregular practice, never taking breaks, repetitive practice, too much fast practice, and learning pieces that are too difficult for your level. The rest of this tutorial, where I analyze each element of incorrect practice with plenty of examples and detailed solutions, can be found in the members area of pianocareeracademy.com. At the end of the video, I also reveal the fourth mega cause of piano injuries and share some additional recovery tips. Don't forget that as a member of our program, you will have unlimited access to our entire library of tutorials which includes our course for beginners, our scale and arpeggio course, our sight reading course, interactive projects, and also hundreds of standalone tutorials for all levels focused on a wide range of piano topics and pieces. Thank you so much for watching. Please give this video a thumbs up if you found it useful. Don't hesitate to share your experience in the comments below. Let me know what you think. 
and I'll see you in the next one. Until then, practice well and stay healthy.